OK, so what does a landing zone actually look like in Azure? Quite often you'd start with a single account, uh, but a landing zone recommendations are to have separate accounts, and this can help to limit the, the blast radius. Uh, if uh, a certain account gets compromised by uh, bad actors, uh, then that allows you to limit the exposure to other parts of the system. So we'll start with uh, a root account. So this really sits at the, the top of everything. Now, within that root account, you would have a control tower. You would have your AWS organizations. And you would also have a service catalog. So if we just talk about those for a minute, uh, Control Tower allows you to uh, create your landing zone. It's specifically uh, created by AWS to support landing zones and uh, allow changes uh, to be made and uh, yeah, really helps with your uh, landing zone implementation. Uh, AWS organizations allow you to have organizational units, which like any uh, large business, will, you'll have different areas. Uh, this allows you to split up your uh, footprint into different organizational units, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you're familiar with Azure, these are similar to management groups. And finally, the, the service catalog. This is, uh, like the name suggests, it's a, a catalog of different services that you can create, which then allows self-service within your environment. So let's say you need to create a new account uh, for a team. They can self-serve through the service catalog, which allows uh, you to create a standardized process for creating accounts that are already secure, they have the right governance in place, and takes a lot of the guesswork out of uh, that whole process. So underneath your root account, you would have your different organizational units. So an example would be uh, suspended. And uh, you might have another one for, for graveyard. So this is where you would put uh, accounts which uh, were no longer required uh, or that you were in the process of decommissioning. So uh, that allows a, a separate area uh, for those. Another area would be migrations. And an, another example would be uh, exceptions. So exceptions to what? Well, organizational units allow you to apply different policies uh, to different areas. So for example, migrations, when you're bringing in workloads from outside of uh, Azure, they, the workloads might not comply with the policies that you intend on implementing. And therefore, you need an area where you can put them in, see what uh, the compliance status is, and then make changes to those environments so that they comply. And then once uh, they comply with the policies, you can then move them elsewhere. Exceptions, uh, likewise, you might have slightly relaxed uh, uh, policies, uh, which uh, you would then apply to uh, individual accounts within there. And that allows uh, you to have policies that uh, generally would apply to everything, but make exceptions for certain accounts. Workloads. So this is where uh, the, your real applications uh, would, would be placed. So uh, you probably separate those out into uh, dev and production. So that allows you to have different policies again for your production applications and workloads, uh, and then uh, slightly different ones for your uh, developer uh, workloads. So as well as this, you'd want some, some shared services. We'll call that infrastructure. You might have one for Sandbox. And this is where, uh, while your teams are getting started with uh, AWS, they can experiment. And you might have uh, relaxed policies there. This would kind of be a short-lived area. You wouldn't want accounts to li live there for a long time, but allows your teams to try things out uh, with less restrictive policies before they get moved into the workloads area. You would also have security. And this is where you would keep your uh, audit accounts 
uh, and uh, your log archives. Uh, these are really important to safeguard and prevent people with, uh, from tampering with them. Uh, and you might keep those for uh, a number of years, uh, depending on what policies uh, that were in place in your particular uh, business. Uh, so that allows all of that to be taken care of and kept uh, so, sort of squirreled away and secure. The final one that we'll add in would be uh, deployments. So if you're implementing uh, uh, DevOps practices, this would uh, well be where your accounts that had your uh, runners for your CI CD uh, platform, they would uh, live in there uh, within their own account. And that, again, that's kind of part of the, the shared, uh, shared infrastructure and shared services that you would uh, make use of elsewhere within your organization. Below these organizational units, you would have accounts. So uh, for example, if we look at the uh, the dev uh, environment, you would have multiple uh, accounts here, uh, so for each of your different workloads. And the same with production, you would have multiple accounts. And as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, those could be uh, automatically vended by your service catalog. You'd also have some, uh, well, a number of accounts over here in your sandbox, and like I said, they'd be short-lived. Over here, you would have uh, one for your uh, logs, and then another one for your other security tools. So that would be things like AWS uh, Security Center, Guard Duty, uh, security Hub, all of those would be uh, secured over, over here in this uh, security account. Here you would have uh, your cloud trail logs, and they would be secured away so that uh, they, they were there in the event of a security incident, and uh, you can investigate those. Within your infrastructure, your networking, and then you might have other shared services. So within your shared services, you might, for example, have a VPN clients. Uh, within your networking, you would probably have uh, a firewall. Uh, you would also have your uh, transit gate gateway. And that allows you to implement a hub and spoke model. So uh, if you're not, not familiar with uh, hub and spoke, it's a very common pattern that uh, you would use uh, in the cloud, so effectively you have a hub, and uh, within that hub you would put uh, a firewall, and uh, this is your sort of core networking, and then that allows each of your different workloads to have its own VPC, which then links into the hub. When traffic flows from uh, one spoke to another, so this is a spoke, this is a spoke, it, it has to go through the hub. And if it wants to go out to the internet, uh, it needs to go through the hub and then out through your transit gateway. And if traffic is uh, coming in, because it needs to uh, access something within this VPC, again, it needs to go through that hub. And that allows you to have security uh, from the hub and only implement a single firewall, have control over that whole area and keep your entire network secure. So, in this diagram, this would exist within uh, the, the networking uh, account, and then there'd be links in to all these different VPCs. So you can see that there's uh, a lot of, uh, this, is, this is your hub, and then these would be your spokes. So uh, as you can see, it can get quite complicated, uh, but each of these uh, organizational units are created according to what your business needs. So this is just an example of, of how it could be set up and is based on the AWS recommendations. Uh, there's uh, an awful lot of white papers that you could read uh, which would help uh, you to learn more about the services that are provided and what the recommendations are for your implementation of landing zones.